Well, welcome to the city of York and this second video in a series about Brexit. I use a phrase called the tyranny of the familiar and it's the mindset that says because something hasn't happened, it won't happen. Well, here we are in April 2019 and it has happened. I couldn't have imagined, nor could many of my compatriots, that we would be in a situation where our entire system of democracy was under threat. Appropriate that we should be filming in York, statue of Constantine, the only Roman emperor ever proclaimed emperor outside of Rome, when these islands were once before under the domination of a European empire. So I want to speak directly to members of other nations and other cultures who have come to Britain to settle. The Poles, the Latvians, the Hungarians, the Lithuanians, the people of Asian cultures and of all nations who've come here for a better way of life, who's, who's, who have espoused British values and the British system of democratic government. Britain had values which meant that this was a safe and free place to settle, to raise your families and to, and to prosper. All of that is now threatening and, and we are now, I think it's fair to say, a bit of a laughing stock for the weakness of our feeble government. We were once a beacon light in the nations and we need to be that beacon once again. A beacon of hope to other European nations, many of whose people feel exactly the same as we do. That actually we want the cooperation, we want the trade, but we want to retain the culture and the, and the sovereignty of our independent nation states. So it's very important now that you share this video with others, particularly the young and those from devastated communities who suffered under the loss of fisheries, coal, steel, nuclear, transportation industries, who suffered because our government wasn't even allowed to bring state aid to industries that were struggling. So late in the video, please do watch to the end because you're going to see me reveal a very important document. It's called FCO 30-1048. That might mean nothing to you, but let me assure you, that document, which represented advice from our foreign office to the, to the governments in 1971 and beyond, is very clear about what the price to be paid would be of our joining the EEC. A loss of sovereignty a loss of control over coal and steel and nuclear and many of our key industries and importantly in that document it shows it shows precisely what mechanism they were going to use to keep this information from the public indeed there's one part of it that says if we can keep this under wraps until the end of the century remember now we're speaking from 1971 then it will be too late to do anything about it by the time the british people discover what's been done absolutely outrageous, please do watch to the end. Let me be clear, this is no longer just a matter of whether we leave or whether we remain. This is now a much bigger issue, concerned with our national sovereignty. We are being led by our political leaders, conspiring with a group of unelected European bureaucrats into a situation where we'll be part of a union, a military union, a political union, an economic union, in which we will have no vote as a people, no say on what happens, and no way to leave. Now this is a time of great division and hardening of attitudes in our nation. Whether you voted to leave or to remain, the question is, do you believe in democracy or not? Do you want to uphold our constitution or not? Because what is happening right now risks trashing a constitutional framework that was specifically set up to prevent the sort of bloody conflict that we saw in Britain more than 300 uh, years ago in the English Civil War. It was that constitutional framework that kept Britain from totalitarianism, from coup d'etat, from revolution that was seen elsewhere in Europe. No free man shall be seized or imprisoned or stripped of his rights or possessions or outlawed or exiled or deprived of his standing in any other way, nor will we proceed with force against him or send others to do so, except by the lawful judgment of his equals or by the law of the land. This legacy of the rule of law of the right to a fair trial, of the fact that Parliament should have a say in the making of legislation and the levying of taxes, of the fact that there should be limits on royal power, was of massive importance. 
But it wasn't uncontested, either at the time or in the centuries that followed. These were the issues over which England fought her civil war in the 1640s. It's not fanciful to think that if that conflict had turned out differently, Magna Carta might now be no more than an obscure footnote of history, and our world might look very different. The English Civil War cost the lives of perhaps as many as one in 20 of all Englishmen, man, woman, and child. Proportionate to population, that's equivalent to three million deaths today. It split families and divided communities. It was a fight to prevent the development in England of an absolute monarchy of the kind that Louis XIV came to embody in France only a few decades later. The Sun King famously pronounced, L'État, c'est moi. I am the state. Those who took up arms against Charles I knew they didn't share that vision. They were in no doubt that Charles was behaving like a tyrant. But they were much less clear about what they'd put in its place. As Oliver Cromwell commented before hostilities began, I can tell you, sirs, what I would not have, though I cannot, what I would. A time would come when Englishmen seeking to make sense of their civil war would characterize it as having been fought to win freedom from a Norman yoke, for liberties which they trace back from before Magna Carta to the first migrations of Angles, Saxons, and Jutes to these islands. In a sense, this was the problem with Magna Carta. It could be used to stop a king abusing his power, but did it have a positive alternative to offer? Even after all the controversies of the 1630s and four years of bloody civil war, no one seemed to know. The Roundheads had beaten the king. They had him a prisoner, but they didn't know what to do with their victory. The new model army, that superbly disciplined force, which had cut the royalists to pieces at Naseby just two years beforehand, was on the verge of mutiny. And in the autumn of 1647, it was camped round here, less than five miles as the crow flies from the Houses of Parliament at Westminster. The bridge didn't exist then. But even so, a troop of cavalry could have been knocking at the doors of the House of Commons within an hour. There was a very real danger of military takeover. It didn't happen. To forestall further unrest, the Parliamentary High Command did something absolutely extraordinary. They invited every regiment of the new model army to send two men here to what was, in effect, a constitutional conference. No army in history had ever seen anything like it before. And here's where they met. The inside of this church has been modernized, but even so, we can get a real flavor of what these army debates must have been like. Through this door to chair them came old Ironsides, Lieutenant General Oliver Cromwell, commander of the Parliamentary Cavalry, and at his side, his son-in-law, Commissary General Henry Ireton, one of the leading lights of the new regime. Take your seats, gentlemen, please. I call this meeting of the General Council of the Army to order at Putney on the 29th day of October in the year of our Lord, 1647. Let us begin by having read to us the document known as the Agreement of the People. That the people of England, being at this day very unequally distributed by counties, cities and boroughs, 
for the election of their deputies in Parliament ought to be proportioned according to the number of inhabitants. If this is to mean that every man is to have an equal voice in the election of representatives, then I have something to say against it. They spent just over two weeks closeted with the delegates from the various regiments, first here, then in lodgings nearby, debating what the future governance of the nation should look like. It wasn't just the fact of these army debates which was amazing, it was what was said as well. Because here, a century and more before their time, men argued for things that have since become an accepted part of the English political landscape. The right to vote for all Englishmen, regular parliaments, religious toleration. In doing so, they were articulating their idea of what they'd been fighting for and what it meant to be an Englishman. One statement more than any other has come to sum up the spirit of those days, spoken by Colonel Rainsborough. If a man be good enough to fight and shed his blood, tell me why this may not be. For really, I think the poorest he that is in England has a life to live as the greatest he. And therefore, truly, sir, I think it's clear that every man that is to live under a government ought first, by his own consent, to put himself under that government. And I do think the poorest man in England is not at all bound, in a strict sense, to that government he's not had a voice to put himself under. This was revolutionary language. What Rainsborough was saying was that government depended on the consent of the governed. It was a throwback to Clause 39 of Magna Carta and a viewpoint diametrically opposed to the one Charles I held. Ideas like this didn't just come out of thin air. They drew on and tapped into three of the most powerful and emotive elements of Englishness. Magna Carta. Anglo-Saxon traditions like the principle that the law should apply to the king as well as to his subjects. And this book, the Bible. The Puritans who'd fought at Cromwell's side in the New Model Army, able to read the Bible in English as a result of the Protestant Reformation, looked to scripture for guidance about how to order the kingdom, just as they looked to it to steer everyday life. In the very first book of the Old Testament, they read this. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. The soldiers who came here argued from this and other biblical texts that there should be democracy based on one man, one vote. For, they said, it was obvious from the wording in Genesis that no man was born to have dominion over another, and all were of equal worth in the sight of God. Responding to the argument that only those who owned property should be allowed to vote, former grocer's apprentice Captain Edward Sexby spoke up indignantly. We have engaged in this kingdom and ventured our lives, and it was all for this to recover our birthrights and privileges as Englishmen. But according to what some say, there are none. There are many thousands of us soldiers that risked our lives. We have no property, yet we have a birthright. But it seems that now, except a man has a fixed estate in this kingdom, he has no right in this kingdom. I wonder we were so much deceived. If we had not a right to the kingdom, we were mere mercenary soldiers. I tell you this, I am resolved to give my birthright to no one. Whatever may come in the way, and whatever be thought, I will give it to none. Poor soldiers like us fought for the preservation of this kingdom. And now we demand the birthright for which we fought with the law of God and the law of our conscience with us. As far as thousands of common soldiers were concerned, this was what they'd been fighting for. 
Even Cromwell, who started out sceptical, began to be swayed by the compelling nature of the arguments. He was neither the first nor the last Englishman to be confronted by the radical message of Scripture. For the army debates show that the Western world's impetus towards democracy is not ultimately rooted in the example of ancient Greece, but in half-remembered Anglo-Saxon customs of freedom and self-government, stiffened by Magna Carta and given extra force by the Bible. Magna Carta, the Great Charter. Together with habeas corpus and the Bill of Rights, it's commonly reckoned one of the three cornerstones of English liberty, a totem of freedom, not only in the land which gave it birth, but throughout the world. So I was one of the many thousands who gathered in Parliament Square on March the 29th, the day that was supposed to be Britain's Independence Day. They quietly protested, and then at the end of Nigel Farage's speech, they sang, I vow to thee, my country. They were amongst the majority of British people who really believed Theresa May when she said Britain will leave the European Union on March the 29th and leave means leave. Well clearly it didn't. So this document, FCO 30 stroke 1048, represented the Foreign and Commonwealth Office advice to government going back to 1971. And it says some incredible things. One of the first thing it says is that uh, the power for our government to assert its national interest and renounce the treaty is unlikely to be eroded in this century. But of course, all that changed with the Lisbon Treaty of 2009. You can see here that it was already talking about economic and monetary union. Here is a comment on national identity. We are conscious through tradition, upbringing and education of the distinctive fact of being British. This final comment there, this national consciousness may be stronger than that of most nations. Here, the implications for national power. The British people believe they order their own affairs, but their instincts derive from past power rather than present realities. Membership involves a permanent merging of important national interest. Her Majesty's government will find their freedom of action in many fields restricted by community decisions. Well, we certainly weren't told that in the 1970s. And here is the, in the annex is the extraordinary list of those areas in which Parliament's freedom of legislative action would be significantly restrained, and there you see it. There you see the origin of why we had to lose our fisheries, why we had to lose um, the coal and steel industries in the way that we did. Wholesale job losses which were, it seems, sacrificed um, at the altar of economic union with the European uh, economic community. So just opposite St Michael the Belfry in York and the Minster is the birthplace of Guy Fawkes. He had some very interesting ideas about what to do with our Parliament. Don't condone them, but it's a great place to get a pint and have a bit of inspiration. So in the latest Brexit twist, the new deadline has been set as the 31st of October. Halloween, the Day of the Dead. An interesting day for them to pick, never anything by chance with the European Union, but what they may have forgotten is that 31st of October was the day in 1940 when the Battle of Britain was won. It was also the day 502 years ago when Martin Luther 
nailed the 95 Theses onto the door of the church at Wittenberg Castle, thereby beginning the Protestant Reformation in Europe. So how about a million man march from here in Yorkshire? I may be 64 years old, but I'd be willing to make that walk down to Parliament. How much better though, if this was a march led by the young, ignited and awakened by the promise of something they've never experienced in their lifetime, life in a free and independent Britain, free to dismiss a whole raft of regulations and rules and laws which would never have been originated in these islands. With it, the promise of new trade, new business with our friends in Europe and around the world, and also a clearing out of a whole generation of career politicians, let's call them the old guard, and a bringing into Parliament of new, fresh ideas, people from commerce, from business, from the world of the military and the civil service, people with an experience of life who can inspire us and give us back the leadership in this nation that we once had and which we have so badly missed. Let's call it a British Spring. I'm going to finish with three comments from overseas on the first video. Paulo from Portugal says, I am a Portuguese living in Portugal. I must say loud thank you for the intelligence, for showing the truth. From the United States, God help you, this breaks my heart. When I think of what you sacrificed just a few decades ago in the pantheon of time, I could cry. Stand up and fight from an American who loves Great Britain. And finally, this from Olivia, who is a Frenchman. I am French and pro Frexit. If you, the oldest and strongest democracy, surrender to the EU, then we are done. As Winston Churchill said, never give in, never, never, never.